Well, welcome again. And uh, two great hymns. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Well, what we sung in that great hymn, And Can It Be? And then it's just confirmed by this great modern hymn. Uh, not I, but through Christ in me. And that's going to be our theme for the next few weeks as we uh, start a new series looking into Romans. But we'll tell you more about that in a moment. Let's focus our thoughts. Let's invite God to come and dwell in our hearts afresh this morning and to really uh, refresh us and renew us as we come to worship him. So these are the words we use on Pentecost Sunday, and I think we should use them every morning, really. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your people and kindle in us the fire of your love. All who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your people. Renew the face of your creation, Lord, pouring on us the gifts of your spirit and kindle in us the fire of your love. And by the spirit, we cry, Abba, Father, come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your people and kindle in us the fire of your love. Many of those words that we've just read in the words in white come from Romans chapter 8 and that's going to be our theme as we go through June and July into the beginning of August. But let's come before God and recognize that we need to say sorry for uh, times when we've put ourselves first and him second that we've not sought his kingdom first, but our own kingdom. And in the words of the Lord's Prayer, we're going to ask for his forgiveness. We're going to pray for his kingdom to come. So let's say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for the kingdom the power and the glory are yours now and forever amen well Week by week, we've been uh, introducing you to people, people from our congregation, people known to us in our congregation who are working elsewhere. And this morning, I want to introduce you to somebody who is known to most of us, who is very local to us, not a member of our congregation, but very involved in the local community. Uh, as I was reading my, uh, in my devotionals this week, it was very clearly sort of pushed through in day after day how important it is to care for those who um, who don't have everything that we have. Uh, they're sort of summarized in the Bible as the, the widows and the orphans, but actually it's uh, a shorthand for all those who are in desperate need, who need our help, who need our love, who need our money, who need our support, who need our care, uh, to care for the widows and orphans. And that's a big part of our life as Christians, is reaching out to those in need. And we do that in all sorts of ways. One of the ways we do that is through Hope Central, which we've been telling you about. But we do it in our own lives and uh, as a church generally. Well, one person who's, who does that in our community uh, through the work that she's uh, doing um, as a counsellor is Julie Smith. And I'm going to introduce you to Julie now. Okay. Hi, well, um, I'm here with Julie Smith. Julie, as many of you all know, is one of our, our local councillors, and it's, it's great to see you, Julie. Hello. Hi, everybody. 
And uh, thanks for agreeing to, to chat to us, just uh, a couple of questions about, you're very, very involved here at Handforth. But before we get into that, just tell us about how, how things are with you and your family. Are you well and how have you been keeping? Yes, well, the, the family's very well, touch wood. Yeah. Um, John's a driving instructor, so he's been practically in lockdown since day one. Um, and not been going out very much at all. And he's chomping at the bit to get back to work, hopefully the beginning of July. Mm -hmm. But um, I've been out doing two jobs. Yeah. Because as, as you know, I work in the pharmacy at the, the health centre, um, as well as in my role as ward councillor. Mm. So yes, I've been very busy and John's not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I'm glad to hear that you've been kept well. But I mean, as a, as a local councillor, you must see an awful lot of um, what's been going on during this time in, in uh, the lockdown in Hanforth it, itself. So it would be great to hear just a, you know, a little bit from you about what you've seen that's really been great that's happened in Hanforth and maybe, maybe something that's concerned you. T yeah, tell, us, tell us what you've seen. Yes. Well, it in the, at, the, at the beginning, um, it was obvious that we were going to need some something in place in Handforth to um, to help the residents. Um, I, I'm aware of a lot of elderly and vulnerable residents through my job at the pharmacy, so it was obvious that we were going to have to step up and do something. Um, so on the 16th of March, I um, put a call out on Facebook. Um, on the local community pages asking for volunteers um, on a neighbours helping neighbours basis mm. and absolutely overwhelmed by the goodwill and, and kindness of people um, within a few days we had um, a database of maybe 86 people wow. so we managed to cover practically every road in Handforth mm. with somebody who would go and, and collect prescriptions or do shopping or just somebody to chat to to um you know from from their neighborhood from from the immediate um area that they lived in and it's carried on for the last 12 weeks and it's been fabulous and and lots of people have benefited from it both the people that have been being helped and the people that are helping Mm. Um, because a lot of the volunteers have come back to me and said how good it's been, how they've made new friends with, with people that they'd been helping, mm. um, that they, they didn't know before, which is a, a, a fabulous, fabulous um, result. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, they hope it's going to carry on after the crisis mm. is over as well, because there's mm. no reason why, you know, they can't, they can't stay friends and, can't help each other out so that was really reassuring because when when I first stood for election that was I always believed that we had a good community here but it's it's definitely been underlined now you know yeah. it's 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 certain that we've got some lovely people in hand forth and we have a fabulous community so yeah I've always I've always felt that as well being the local vicar obviously I get to see things like that as well and there's a very strong community feel isn't there mm, yes yes and you see it more when when there's um you know when there's something like this yeah. um I've, I've seen it happen on a couple of occasions um last year for instance when we had the the um threat of travellers yeah. on the park you yeah. know um and and we put a call out on facebook and to ask people if they could protect the park mm. um and within a couple of hours there was nose to tail cars preventing mm. any any vehicles yeah. driving onto the park and it was just mind-blowing really to think that people people do care and that that's the thing mm. you know mm. and yeah, I just I just think it's been wonderful. The things that have concerned me initially with um, with this coronavirus, the things that concerned me were were the elderly and the vulnerable. But as it's gone on, and those people who have been matched up with volunteers and they've been helped, um, I'm now finding that it's it's shifted more to people um, younger people with families 
with young children um, that have been struggling. Um, And my concern is that a lot of them don't actually ask for help. Yeah. For yeah. various reasons, um, I had one one lady saying, you know, that she was ashamed, mm. and and that that bothers me. Yeah. You know that that we need to we need to find a way to get a message out there to people that there's no shame in asking for help, mm. and and that they 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 needn't struggle. There are people there mm. that want to help them. The number of people, the number of the 86 volunteers that have rung me from time to time and said, I've not had anybody phone for help this week. Is everything okay? Are you still doing it? And, you know, because people do want to help and it's, it's a way of finding, well, it's a matter of finding a way to get that message out there that you know, yeah. can ask for help. and It's available. So I'm going to put this video on the service, but I might also post it on our Facebook page. Whilst I'm asking you that question, if somebody sees this and says, well, okay, I do need help, how can they contact you? Well, um, I'm always available through Facebook mm-hmm. um, or email mm. on my Cheshire East email address, which is julie.low at Cheshire, um, Julie, sorry, julie.smith at cheshireeast.gov.uk. Okay. I was reverting to the previous name then. <laughs> um, or they can phone me. Yeah. Phone me on my, my mobile, 07967 I'm always available. And if I'm not, leave a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Brilliant. Um, I do try to answer, you know, all inquiries immediately or you know as soon as is possible um great thank thanks julie yeah uh so i hope that you know maybe somebody watching this who does know or knows somebody who needs help mm, uh, yes who, um but it's great to hear of the community spirit of wanting to to reach out and to help neighbors and i've seen it myself um and y- you'll know because you've been involved with us a little bit that we've We've worked through Hope Central, our charity, to, to get food parcels out to people. And we've seen an enormous uh, surge of um, help v- offered to us as a charity. Yes. And people dropping food off and wanting to take parcels out and, and things like that. Um, you know, from your, your perspective, Julie, when you've, um, what you see out in the community I mean, how, what more could we be doing as a church? What are we doing that's right? What could we improve and, and things like that? I think as far as the church is concerned, obviously you need to reopen, don't you? Which is going pretty imminent, I believe, for private... In, in some ways it's outside of prayer. our... Hands where we've been told we're allowed to open for private prayer and very limited funeral uh, opportunities without organists and things like that. But that comes from... Um, from our diocese and so they're informing us uh, on a Mm. you know a weekly basis so hopefully the building might open for private prayer at some stage soon but uh i'll let you know when when we do good because i I think that that brings a lot of comfort to people doesn't it and you know it's it it gives it i won't say gives them a purpose but it's you know it's 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 a step back to normality, I think, for a lot of people. Um, so I think that will help. Um, as far as you helping as a church, I mean, you know, I've been involved with Anne and mm. the ladies and gents at, at Hope Central, and what a fabulous job they do there. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm, I just, I just think it's wonderful that they're, they're there every day and and making up parcels for people, and it makes such a difference. Um, I, the, the people that have said to me, you know, that the, one man said the other day that it, he felt his life had been saved. Wow. And that's, that's pretty powerful, that. And it makes you wonder how many other people mm. um, have been helped in the same way that we haven't spoken to, haven't got feedback from. Mm. Um, and, and of course, you're one of our 86 volunteers, aren't you? So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you're doing more than your fair share there. So yeah, yeah I think it's it's just really getting letting getting people 
um, a sense of normality back into the lives, isn't it? Um, and of course, when uh, Cafe Aroma opens again as well, because I know lots of people relied yeah. on that for, from a social aspect. And yeah, you know, yeah. And you know, I walk through the village as you do from time to time, and mm -hmm. people stop me and say, "When are you opening again?" And uh, mm -hmm. it's it's hard for people when things that they've been used to, and the church has never closed before, not like this. Um, no. And schools, similarly, you know, they've never been closed for this length of time. So it really is uh, had a massive impact on on people's lives. So, but we want obviously to keep people safe and make sure that when we do start to resume things, that they're not. Yes. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to say to us, Julie, whilst you're on? Um, I, I, just to say that um, I know a lot of your, your parishioners that may be watching this come into the pharmacy and um, I've been accused of being a bit a bit bossy over the past couple of months but and I'm, I'm really sorry if I came across like that but I was only doing it because I care and I, don't, I wanted to keep you safe. <laughs> People were coming in and I was saying, what are you doing now? You need to be at home. <laughs> Bring this number and get a volunteer. Yeah. So... Apologies for that, but it was, you know, well-intentioned. <laughs> I really don't think you need to apologise, Julian. I can't imagine you being bossy, but there we are. <laughs> John, John, I'm sure, would say different. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us and uh, oh. thank you for what you're doing, and thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. It's great to catch up with Julie earlier in this week and, um, and hear things from her perspective in the community. Uh, we're going to turn to God's Word now and we're going to look at a couple of passages as I've been telling you we're going to start a series through Romans chapter 8 but we're going to have uh, a reading from John first and then a little bit from Romans 7 leading into 8. So we're going to turn to John chapter 3, very familiar verses to begin with. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people have loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has not been done in the sight of God. This is God's word. And now from Romans chapter 7 to start with, leading through to chapter 8. Paul says, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. I'll start that again. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. 
and now I am going to play a recording of how I unpacked those verses and spoke about them. So we're beginning a new series uh, that I've called The Normal Christian Life. What does the normal Christian life look like according to the Bible? Uh, I'm not asking you to think of somebody you might know or, or Christians that you've come across, but what does the Bible tell us that the normal Christian life looks like? Well, we're going to look, and we're going to look at it by unpacking just one chapter in the Bible over the next couple of months. It's one of the most beautiful and well-known chapters, one of the most cherished and loves, loved. It's Romans chapter 8, which is quite a long chapter, and it ranges through many different experiences of life. It talks about suffering. Uh, it talks about the deep groaning inside uh, at what's going on in the world, in our hearts. It talks about our own personal experience of God, the Holy Spirit, working in our lives and what Jesus has done for us. But we're going to look at how the Christian life starts today, what it looks like. And we may think, well, I know this, I've been a Christian for a long time. But I don't know about you, but I never grow tired of hearing the simple gospel message of what it means to be a Christian. I never grow tired of that. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, and it's amazing. So we're going to look at just the first two verses of Romans chapter eight today, and a little bit of chapter seven. But we'll be moving on through the whole chapter bit by bit over the weeks that follow. So for today, three things. Firstly, the problem we all face. Secondly, the solution that's offered. And thirdly, how we can experience God's peace and know him. But firstly, we must look at the problem that we all face. You see, we're exactly halfway through Paul's letter here, and there's 16 chapters, and we're right at the beginning of chapter 8, and it's Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome, the Roman church. And he reaches this high point in his letter by saying, there is therefore now no condemnation. But because that little word therefore is there, we've got to understand what he's been talking about, because it won't make sense otherwise. And what he's been talking about in the chapter preceding is a great struggle that's going on in his life and in his heart. The struggle is to, he's, he tries to be obedient to the law of God. He tries to follow what uh, God's commands say. And in chapter seven, you can read all about that struggle. And in effect, he says, he realized that there's something deeply wrong inside him. Because as he says in, in verses 18 and 19, he says, Look, I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. I, I think all of us can relate to that in some way. Even the nicest person we know, if we're honest, would say, well, that's true of me. I know what I want to do, but I don't always do that. And in fact, the things I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. And we could just say, well, <laughs> that's just normal life, isn't it? We all mess up. We're no different to anyone else. It's just some of us are slightly better at it than others. But there's more to it than that. Deep down, we know that there's something wrong. We see it in the desperate need for justice in our world. I'm sure none of us can have uh, missed the events unfolding in uh, the world uh, and in our own country following the tragic death of George Floyd over the last week or two. We've, we've watched it with deep alarm. We know that what happened was deeply wrong and there's a sense that there needs to be justice. But some of the events that have followed in our world and in our own country seem deeply wrong as well. Where is justice? We want it. We need it. We know that. And somewhere deep down in our hearts, we know that there's a problem because we're all guilty. 
We just know that instinctively. We've watched um, a, a documentary, a brilliant BBC documentary, uh, well, not a documentary, a, a drama over the last couple of weeks. Um, so spoilers in this, if you haven't watched this, um, then I'm gonna give away a bit of the plot, but it's called The Capture. And it's a superb piece of drama. Uh, and it, it starts with a soldier who's in the dock in a court being accused of killing uh, a man in the field unlawfully. And it's not clear from the, the video footage on the camera helmet from another soldier whether he did it in self-defense or not. And the story unfolds. But to start with, he gets let off on a technicality to do with the camera and he's free and the rest of the story unfolds it's a brilliantly done drama i encourage you to watch it but how it ends is what is amazing it ends with him uh going to prison again for something he didn't do and everybody knows he didn't do what he's sent to prison for but when he sits uh and talks to his wife who comes to visit him right at the end. He just says, I know I deserve to be here. And it takes you back right to the very first bit of the story. Deep down he knows that what he did was wrong. And he's serving his prison sentence and he feels like it's right. Even though the reason that he's there He's not guilty of. It's a brilliantly done story, but it points to the fact that deep down, we know that there's something wrong. It's wrong in the world, we can see that, but we know our own hearts aren't right as well. And that's what Paul says here. He says it really clearly, actually. If you look back through the book of Romans, he says in Romans chapter three, there's no one righteous, not even one, there's no one who understands, there's no one who seeks God. This week, I watched a, an interview with a young woman called Rachel Gilson, who's just written a book. Uh, and she was being interviewed by uh, a guy called Glenn Scrivener. And uh, it's her story of how she became a Christian. And she tells of how she was an atheist, uh, hadn't been brought up in Christian circles at all. And she looked at Christianity as something, well, as she describes it, lame. Uh, that Christians were lame and uninteresting and dull. But she's drawn to what they believe. And she's in the room of a friend of hers at university one day, and she notices a book on her shelf. The book's called Mere Christianity. She was never heard of C.S. Lewis, didn't know anything about the Narnia stories, but she's intrigued by the title. So she steals the book from her friend because she's too embarrassed to ask to borrow it. And she says she started reading it in between classes uh, while she was at university. And during the interview, this is what she says. She says this. While I was reading that day, I was suddenly overwhelmed by the feeling that not only did a God exist, but the God exists. And I could sense in a way, even though I didn't have the vocabulary for the word holy, could sense it. It was like I could feel holiness in the sense of perfection and transcendence and that one day I was going to have to give account. And she said, I was deeply afraid. And she says, I was mean, I was arrogant, I was sexually immoral, I was a liar, I was a cheater, I was reading a stolen book. There was not a lot left in the innocent category for me to cling to, she said. And then she says how she sat down and with just that knowledge of the holiness of God and her own sinfulness, she says to God, fine, I don't know what to do. But she gives him her life. That's what Paul is expressing here. That he knows how serious it is to encounter the living God. And the first step to becoming a Christian is at some point, it might not be the first thing you realize, but at some point you realize that God is holy. 
and that deep down you know you are not right it's what the bible calls conviction and as paul talks about this he reaches a point in his own life of feeling despair i'm in trouble like rachel gilson said she said i feel deeply afraid paul says it this way he says wretched man that i am who will deliver me from this body of sin See, the Bible is very straight with us. We all stand condemned before God. In our gospel reading, we heard those words. That without Christ, we are, or we do stand before God as condemned. You might not feel it, but the moment God comes near, we feel his holiness and we feel fear because we do not and cannot measure up. That's the problem we all face. But secondly, what the answer we all need, Paul's question, Rachel's question about fear, Paul's question, who will deliver me from this body of death? It's a serious question. It's a serious question for each of us. We're guilty. We're in the dock. Who will actually deal with this? And Paul bursts out with this wonderful, overwhelming statement at the end of chapter 7. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the whole gospel message. Who can deliver us? Jesus. Only Jesus. One day he will be the judge of the world. The Bible makes that very clear. One day he will return as a judge. But when you read the scriptures, we realize he was born as a human. He lived among us. He lived a life, a human life, that we should have lived. He did not sin. And yet on the cross, when he was put to death, he took the punishment that we face, and then he offers us freedom. It's the answer we need. And Paul exclaims, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Without Christ, in our lives, there is condemnation. But when we are in Christ, we're able to stand in the presence of a holy God and know that there's no condemnation. The sentence has been served. The death penalty has been carried out on Jesus, who freely and willingly and through his own choice died for the sole reason that he could have you and me with him for eternity. Thirdly and finally, how does that wonderful truth become effective in you and me? That is the truth of the gospel. How does that come into us? Well, Paul says it's through the presence of God's spirit in our lives. Verse two says, the spirit of the law uh, of life has set us free. Sorry, the spirit has set us free from the law of sin and death. Earlier in Romans, Paul explains that it's all to do with faith and trust and where we put our confidence. If we put our confidence in ourselves, in our own efforts, we remain condemned. But when we submit to God and by faith, accept that we are sinful and ask for his forgiveness and God gives us that forgiveness freely. We don't have to earn it. And that happens because God comes in to our lives through the Holy Spirit and brings the finished work of Jesus into us. And when that happens, there's peace. Or as Paul puts it here, there's freedom. 
peace from striving to be something or be someone or prove ourselves somehow. There's a deep joy and a happiness that comes from knowing that we're loved unconditionally, no matter what our past has in it. The slate is wiped clean. No matter what the future brings, no matter how much we mess up, nothing. You see, this is how Paul ends this wonderful chapter. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus. So what does all this mean for us now? To anyone who's listening to this, who we need to hear this truth of this word. When you and I stand before God, and we will one day, we will know that we're guilty. We can't point to others and compare ourselves to others, because there'll be no doubt. Before God, we stand guilty, and we deserve the verdict, the punishment. But if we're willing to accept that the price has been paid, the sentence has been served, the debt has been cancelled because of what Jesus did, then that freedom can come into our lives. We can reject it by rejecting Jesus. But that leaves us guilty as charged. But if we accept Jesus, then right now, we can know his freedom, his forgiveness, and no condemnation. Put it in your own words. Don't try and be fancy, just be honest before God. In Rachel Gilson's testimony, she just sat down one day, she didn't know how to pray, she just said, fine. And in that word, in her heart, she accepted everything that she knew, which wasn't a lot at that point, but everything that she knew about God's love for her. But to those of us who've done that, who've accepted Jesus, who know this truth and believe this truth, here's what I want to say. There's now no condemnation. Circle it in your Bible, that little word now. Tell your heart that truth today and every day. Now is not something that will happen to you in the future when you get to heaven. It is now. When God looks at you, he's pleased with you now. He's as pleased with you as he is with his own son, Jesus, because Jesus lives in you through the presence of his Holy Spirit. And you will say to me, but I still mess up. And that's true. Well, it's true for me. Anyway, what about that? Isn't God disappointed with us? Well, we'll come back to that in the weeks that follow. But no, he is not disappointed with us. Now he sees Jesus in you. And nothing can change that. Now there is no condemnation. The Spirit sets us free. When that becomes real afresh to you and me, you want to tell people because there's a joy beyond any joy that the world can offer. And you want to tell people about that freedom. Uh, and maybe that joy has grown cold, lukewarm. Well, the Bible tells us to open the door again, the door of our heart to the wonderful Lord Jesus, which you can do again today and every day every morning. I'm going to end with those wonderful words from that hymn that we sang right at the beginning of the service. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to his. Oh, how strange and divine. I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Amen. Well, we're going to unpack what that means more and more as the weeks go by. 
but I'm just going to pause for a moment and let you be quiet before God. We sang at the beginning, no condemnation now I dread Jesus and all in him is mine. Make that your own this morning for just a moment. Let's be quiet. And then Joe, uh, my Joe, is going to lead us in some prayers. Morning, everyone. Let's pray. Some words from Psalm 9. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Sing the praises of the Lord enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. Father God, we praise you today for who you are and for all your blessings. We pray for our world that your kingdom will come and that this crisis will turn the hearts of many to seek you and find you. We pray for all Christians meeting today to praise and worship you, whether in person or online. And we pray for your Holy Spirit to be poured out on all our brothers and sisters around the world. We continue to pray that you'll deliver this world from the virus and especially we pray for those countries and communities where cases are still rising and who have limited resources to implement the measures necessary to contain the virus. We pray for protection and healing for those who are most vulnerable and for wisdom from world leaders in tackling this crisis. We pray for the scientists who are working to develop tests, treatments and vaccines, for collaboration and cooperation, to find answers quickly and for the good of everyone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We pray for those in need and we thank you for the provision of our needs. We pray for health and strength, for comfort and healing for those who need it. We pray especially now for those that we know who are in particular need at this time, those who are affected by the virus and those who have other physical, emotional or material needs. In a moment of silence, please lift to God those you know who need healing or comfort now. Lord, we lift each person that we've thought about just now to you, and in Jesus' name we pray for them. Amen. We pray for ourselves and our community. We thank you for our village and for the way that so many are working together to support those who are vulnerable at this time. We ask you to show us how we can each demonstrate your love to those around us. And we pray for your blessing and protection on all our families and friends. We ask for your forgiveness for us and for the grace to forgive others. We pray that you will give us hearts of flesh to love, understand and bless those around us, even if they hurt or offend us. And finally, we pray for the situation caused by the death of George Floyd. We pray for justice for those who have felt the effects of any form of prejudice or oppression. And we ask you to bring peace to communities torn apart by riots and by clashes between opposing groups. We ask you to work in hearts and minds that everyone may realise that you created us all equal and you love everyone equally. And Lord, begin with us. Make us full of your love and bold to speak out for justice. So keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support the anxious and fearful and lift up all who are brought low, that we may rejoice in your comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And we're going to finish our prayers by saying the collect for today. So I'll just share the words for that and then we can pray together. So we pray together. God of truth, help us to keep your law of love and to walk in ways of wisdom that we may find true life in Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Thanks to Joe for those prayers. Well, we're going to close our service this morning with another great hymn that uh, talks about 
the amazing love that God's shown us in Jesus. Here is love vast as the ocean. It's the great hymn that 